have VirtualBox installed, this program right here that allows us to create virtual machines in any operating system. If you don't have it um, in your computer, you just have to look for VirtualBox and it will direct you to the website where you can see the current version and we just have to choose on which operating system we're going to use it on Windows or Mac or Linux. Okay, you download it, you install it and then you will have something like this. Okay, VirtualBox is ready. What do we need after we install VirtualBox? Well, we need to download Debian's image. Okay. Um, in Google, we can also search for Debian download and it will show us a link to choose the distribution or the direct link where we download the most common, which is a CD image. We click on it and we choose the most stable always, which is the recommended for the systems in production. And as for the architecture, normally the modern computers are 64 bits. If we have an old computer, we can choose i386, but in our case, we choose the 64 bit option. And in here, it offers us the files that are the images, which we could burn on a CD, or like in our case, emulate it. The first option is a very basic installation. It doesn't even have a graphic environment. But the one I recommend is this one right here. It has a light desktop, very practical, and it works pretty well. We click on the link to download it. It starts downloading the image. And while it finishes, we're going to create our virtual machine. To do that, we go to VirtualBox. We create a new machine. We click on this blue star. And then we write the name we want to appear on the left. I'm going to write Debian 9. Uh, it could happen that in certain systems, it won't allow us to choose the 64-bit version, only the 32-bit. That means that virtualization is not set in your system or your hardware. So it depends on what you're using. So you will have to activate it in the BIOS or update or activate all the characteristics for virtualization in your operating system, a little search on internet will do. We click on next and here we select out of all the RAM available in our real computer, the host, how much we're going to dedicate to our virtual machine. Well, I'm going to select in this case four gigabytes, which is more than enough. It's not recommendable that you assign too much. It tells you right here, orange is dangerous and in red, the host can have problems or even crash. Let's always stay in the green zone. And it depends on what we're going to install, we can assign more or less. And we also need to create a folder in our host operating system, which is going to act as a virtual hard drive. We're going to create one right now and we choose by default its own way of working, its own type of files, the VDI. We click next. And here we have two options. The dynamically reserve is going to increase the size of the folder in our real computer as the virtual machine needs it, or set a fixed size to avoid problems later on. But it could be a waste because we're not going to actually use all that space so we're going to use dynamically reserved and we're going to set it for example 12 gigas and this is the name that the folder is going to have for the virtual machine click on create and now we have my virtual machine ready let's see if the download finished yes it has we have our image now i'm going to click on settings and i'm going to set under storage that the cd which is being virtualized but it's empty is actually going to contain this image that we just downloaded we go to downloads debian open and accept and what we just did was like inserting a real city into our machine now i click on start and when it does well, our Debian installation is going to pop up. Um, I'm always going to choose the normal installation because it goes faster. 
Um, if you want to see the graphic installation, it's exactly the same. Press enter, the next. If we don't see this window, like I said, it is emulating a real computer. So this is a totally real installation. Then we choose the language. We press S to go to Spanish. I click enter. We choose the country and then the keyboard. The keyboard is very important. We click on Spanish. Of course, it depends on the country you are in. You have to choose your own settings. Okay, now, if you look down here, it tells us that it's reading from the CD, the virtual CD. And this turns green when it's reading from the virtual CD. Here we configure the net, that I'll explain later, and the USB devices. A very important key here tells us which is the host key. It depends on the system. It is important to have it in mind because sometimes the mouse disappears inside and we have to press that key to liberate it. Good. As for the installation, it's going to ask us the name of the machine. I'm going to write Curseame. We are not going to use the domain's name. We can leave it blank or write Curseame, whatever. In this case, we just click on next. This is very important. It's root's password. We can't forget this because that will allow us to administrate the system. If we lose this password, we're going to have a hard time. We write the password, click next, remember the password. Now it creates a new user without administrator privileges. Why? Well, it's always a good idea to use the system without admin privileges. That way, we don't risk ourselves to damage something important. Or in case we get a malware, virus, whatever, we avoid letting it run with too many privileges. At the beginning, it asks us for a name. Here we can write whatever we want because actually the system doesn't use it. It's just an administrative thing. We can write user account or Antonio Sanchez or whatever. The important one is this one right here which I'm going to use to enter. I'm going to write student. This is the word, the user's account, the login I'm going to use to enter the system. Click on next, password, and confirm my password. Now the time zone. Here it depends on your country. In my case, I'm in Spain, in the peninsula. I click on peninsula and the installation continues. This part is very important if the machine is real, I mean. How I am going to administer the hard drive partitions, because normally we already have an operating system and Linux, we install it in another partition so we can use both. It is crucial not to eliminate any partition that we are using, okay? In this case, since we don't have any problem, we're going to do it very fast. We're going to select the guided method using the whole disk because we don't have anything to keep. We choose the disk, okay? See how the configuration I set is there, the 12 gigas. And it also asks us how many partitions we want to create. The most simple thing is to use only one partition. Here it tells us the changes it's going to make. It's going to create two partitions, one in which the system is going to be, that is pointed out with a slash on the right, the system symbol, Linux is going to be installed there. And then a swiping area which we're going to use as a virtual memory. This is very important and this is the basic configuration in any Linux system. We say yes. It wants us to confirm. I repeat, this is a crucial step. Make sure we are not breaking anything or damaging the system. And we say yes, so it can start overriding this partition, so it can start copying the files. This step asks us if we want to search on the internet to download more packages besides the ones the CD image already has. Also for more recent packages. I, in this case, I'm going to say no. 
and then if it is the case i will update them myself okay let's make the installation quicker let's say no just install the packages that are on the cd in our case we're going to say yes we want to participate in the survey here we're going to choose what we want to install we have three options the desktop environment our window manager and diverse utilities we're going to choose all of them and then click continue this part is also very important because it is the boot manager which is the program that selects which operating system starts when we turn the computer on in our case we only have one system but we still need to install the group so we say yes we do want to install the boot manager in which disk well we only have one so there is no problem we choose the one that it shows us if it didn't show us or we had many partitions we could manually select it in here in our case as i said it can install it on the whole disk we click enter now it finished the installation and it asks us to remove the cd so it doesn't start with the installation of debian again when we reboot the system in this case it does it by itself so we just click on continue so what we're seeing is a boot manager this is the group it has a timeout that is a time limit if we don't select anything it chooses the default operating system we are going to enlarge this window so you can see it better now what we're seeing is precisely the um, the window manager in here we are going to select the user student and the password that we chose we click enter the xfce is going to ask us if we want to create some personalized panels or to create one in blank i recommend to choose using the recommended configuration so we have something we can modify if not we would have to do it ourselves here we can choose the desktop's resolution in this case we will just leave it as it is what can we see well the first thing we should do is to install and configure the repositories where we're going to ask for the software packages i'm going to do everything with the terminal so you can see that you can do that without any problem the first thing i do is to write su to become admin to become root and the password i've chosen in the installation now I edit the etc folder apt sources.list that is the repositories folder what I usually do is to comment all the lines and the penultimate I leave it as it is but I erase the updates part I leave all the packages okay as I said this is a very basic configuration if it were an operating system in production, we will have to leave the updates part and take into account what's above about security, but it's going to work just fine like this. If you need more instructions, here is main, which is the main. You could also write country, number three, SD, but for now, it should work fine. If you have a repository in your country that is closer and faster, you can look the location on internet up and paste it in here. Press Control X, save and we will have our repositories list what do we have to do next well we have to see if we have internet i can look up my ip using ip space a just to see if i have a valid ip i can also make a ping to google.com just to make sure that i currently have an internet connection okay it answers me it gives me the ip so this means that the dns is working and it makes the ping so i do have a connection that only means that i can use the next instruction which is very important apt-get update it searches in the repositories and it also updates the list of available packages together with their versions uh, if you notice there are some changes in debian regarding other versions to see the ip i had to write ipa 
because the common if config is obsolete, okay? The famous if config. If you want to have it, you will have to write apt-get install net tools, okay? It will install the net tools now that we have all the repositories correctly installed. Check again and you will have if config, all right? Um, I recommend you that when we have these big changes, we get used to the new commands. If they consider that this command is now obsolete, well, we would have to learn the substitute, that in this case is the command IP. Another one that we don't have anymore is aptitude. It's a very common program to install packages. If we wanted it, we will have to install it too, okay? with apt get install aptitude. Now it is going to make some changes. When we have this kind of configurations, I recommend you to check how many it is going to erase, okay? Because sometimes it erases too many packages and it could be dangerous. As long as they are new or just to update, there shouldn't be any problem. So I say yes. And with this, now I have two very common commands in this distribution. And I repeat again, I recommend you to know the basic way and the new way without having to install anything, in this case with apt. And if we want to use aptitude, we can use it. I can use it right now. Aptitude, update, it is going to work without any problems. And with this, we will have our system ready, prepared to learn everything we need about Linux. And more importantly, about the common interpreter, Bash. In case we want to configure our net, right now we can do two things. Either we click on this icon where we see we have an active connection and configure it there. But as always, I prefer to explain that using the terminal and I can edit the etc folder, network, interface, okay. Now it shows us the interface that we actually see before, but I can change all the configuration that is necessary, okay? In this case, I will be configuring network manager. And in this one, the one I have here in the terminal, it would be a more classical configuration, more system-like. To configure it, I have to know what's the name of the interface. If you notice, a moment ago we used IPA because now, well, back then it would say ETH0. Now the nomenclature has changed too. That's not a problem. We will have to copy. Then I make a configuration like we said before. And what would I have to write? Auto. And the configuration, well, this is the most basic characteristic. And then I face the same interface and the protocol INET. And I could add the DHCP if you have it activated, add the DHCP to the automatic configuration, or I could write static. So I set all the values. What values? Well, the IP address 192.168.100.208, for example. Netmask 255.255.255.0 and the gateway 192.168.100.1 and in here I can put the, um, the DNS if I have the package resolve conf installed if not I will have to go to the etc folder let's save now and let's go to the etc folder resolve.com all right here now we have the our dns set the one set are by default i'm going to add this one and if you notice it is generated by network manager okay so if you don't want this to be overridden you should deactivate it all right in this case we say that this is correct so we'll leave it like that the next step once we have the configuration files would be etc slash init.d slash networking restart. Okay, we restart the net so it applies the changes. Right now the IP that my interface has is this one right here. All right, a private net that VirtualBox creates. 
And if we go here to Net, Networking Setting, it tells us that we are working in NAT, all right? Um, there is another way with Bridge Adapter, this one. That is, there is an exact equivalency between the virtual network interface and the real one. So there isn't any virtualized net and we will have to use the real information of our network, which is the thing I did. I'm going to restart it since I changed the NAT configuration. And then I'm going to write IPA to see if it worked. And in this case, it didn't. Let's restart again. Since the data was correct, but it didn't work, what we did was restarting the machine because when we change the adapter, it's like we change some hardware. So we restart so it grabs all the configuration of software and hardware correctly. So when we type IPA, now it has correctly changed our IP address. If I test it making a ping to google.com, we see that the DNS is working and the connectivity too. Regarding the DNS, we always have to check the etcresolve.com, okay? Back then, we saw that it was generated with a network manager. I remind you that it is a daemon. It is a process you can manage in here. I can say stop, and this would stop changing my configuration. Above on the right, we see an X. If we recheck our IP configuration, as I say in ETC, network interfaces, we have the, um, the name of our card, the configuration, we said static. If we want to use our router that we have in a real network, we can set the DHCP. If not, it won't work. And here in this case, a fixed IP. It is very important to know the router address, the gateway, and then we could use our virtual machine just perfectly. Once we have seen a little theory as an introduction and that we know where in the system is the common interpreter located, what we can find in a classic Linux system in text mode is what you see on screen, okay? So we simply have a prompt waiting for us to log in. We would have to enter our username and password. In our case, we would write student and in here the password so it won't show up, not even the asterisks. The system is getting it. All right. Here we can start typing. So our terminal that we executed is waiting for our instructions, instructions that we would have to know. And even though it is hard at the beginning, as we get used to them, we'll notice that they come out naturally. Besides that, one advantage of Linux is that it has a lot of help and explanations when we're working with comments. It tells us how to use them. All right. First of all, I'm going to use one to clear the screen. So we type the instruction and press enter. The order I gave was clean my screen. The, um, the bash, or as I say, barrabin barabash, which is the interpreter that has started with the system, because that was my instruction, this user, student, has to use the bash. It shows us more information to the left of our prompt, all right? Here we can see how we are using instructions or comments, all right? And then we see that we have to the left of the at, wait a moment, that's too big. We see that at the left of the at, we have the username, then an at, and then we have the name of the system, the name of this computer. So this is telling me that I am the user student in Corsia computer, all right? That's how I named this machine. And then in here, it tells us where we are in the file system, all right? Okay, I will explain that a little bit later. Now here the prompt is waiting for our instructions, okay? All right. Um. When we start telling the system what it has to do, we have to follow a syntaxis. A syntaxis is how we write what rules I have to follow for the system to understand me. Because if I write, for example, show me uh, the directory, 
Obviously, it doesn't understand it. It doesn't know what show me is. So we have to get to know some commands that are basic and those instructions have a structure. For example, I will always execute an instruction somewhere in our system, in a directory, in a folder. If I wanted to know where I am right now, I could write the instruction PWD. That's the name of the instruction. Then I press enter and it would tell me you're currently in slash home slash student. Perfect. The aid that Linux provides me is so powerful that I could do the following. The page man, that's the name, offers me uh, a wide explanation for many comments. All right? So, if I write this, it tells me that command, pwd, has these characteristics, this is used with these options. This is simply another look. I will explain more about it later and I will tell you how you can install it in Spanish. All right? Start to learn how to use a common interpreter. It is very important that when I write an order, um, I stop to think to put everything in its place. There are some very easy orders that don't need any extra, like the ones we saw a while ago, PWD, it already knows I'm telling it, show me the folder I'm in. That is, show me what is the path I'm at. All right, there are other ones we can use, like clear the screen, it doesn't need anything else. But there are some that need a series of arguments and some other options, all right? For example, I could write, show me the content, and that command is called ls, it works in a different way. There are orders that can receive optional parameters and if I don't write anything else, it assumes something. In this case, if I say, show me the content of a directory, but which one? If I don't specify it, he assumes I'm talking about the current one, okay? The one I'm in right now. As it doesn't have anything, well, it directly shows me the next line and waits for another order. But I could say, the folder I wanted to show me the content from, for example, show me the folder home. And it tells me that there are two elements, the, the folder tux and the folder student, all right? As if I said, bring me an order, but what do you want me to bring you? Well, bring me a chair, bring me a table, bring me whatever, all right? It has a... Um, um, a similar way of working as we normally talk, okay? Show me that folder. Then it also has some modifiers. I can ask it to show me that folder, but in a certain way. Show me that folder, but besides that, I want you to display more information about its elements. Then I would say it is showing me the same elements, student and talks, but in a different way. It is also telling me their last modified date, who it belongs to, which we're going to see later on, etc. Therefore, keeping our example of a phrase, I could say, bring me a chair, but I could specify how, bring me a chair quickly, bring me a chair carefully, bring me a chair and a table, All right? So, the main thing is to write the command, the action, show me show me a list, create, uh, then I tell it over what elements I wanted to perform the action, okay? So let's remember, this is the command or the action, the ls, list, list something. What is it that I wanted to list? That would be the parameter. Then the modifier with a minus symbol, a dash. That tells me how it has to make the action, all right? If you notice, it is very important that I left a space in here and another one in here. We have to be very careful with the spaces because that's what the interpreter uses to know that this is an action, that this is another part, in this case a command, and this is another part. In this case, a modifier, all right? 
So we have to be particularly careful with spaces. Why? Because if I said ls, ls slash, then I left a space and then write home, I would be saying something completely different. I would be saying, show me what's in the folder slash and what is in the folder home. All right. It interprets, due to being separated, that they are different things. All right. So we need to pay a lot of attention. If I execute that, well, it tries to show me both contents, but it's just that slash does exist because it's the system's root, but home, there isn't any folder in the path I'm in with the name home. That's why it displays an error, but it tries to display the content of those two folders. That way, as we are seeing that a command can work waiting one or more parameters. Each command has its own way of working. The important thing is to respect those three parts, okay? The order, the command I want to give, the parameters I'm going to use. Some commands will allow me only one parameter, or they definitely need two parameters, or maybe we can put many, okay? We don't have limits, so to speak. And also the options. The options always need to have a dash, right? That way I can write ls home dash l, okay? Show me the content in detail, but there are many modifiers. I could also say show me the hidden files. That's an A, okay? Then I see two other elements right there, dot and double dot, which we're going to explain later on, all right? What I mean is that I could have written dash L dash A, okay? It understands that there is a modifier L and a modifier A, but it is very common for them to be together, to join them. So we avoid having to write another space and another dash. If there is a dash, it's going to wait for modifiers that always, or usually, are going to be only one letter to abbreviate or make it a little faster. That way I can join many, okay, that would order things by date, okay. As always, I could use a man page, and it will help me a lot. So, in this course, we're studying command by command, and I will explain all the um, most important attributes and the most important modifiers, and how we can start practicing with them and understand them, all right. But foundations are very important, and I insist in that we must understand command, parameter, and options. I could allow myself to write the options after or before. This interpreter will get it. I will have to be more careful with other ones. They might be more strict with the syntax. In the last order, I could have put it like this. The modifier, because when it sees a dash, it knows what it is, all right? And that order will do exactly the same as ls home dash l okay i could even write a in here and then write l in here no problem it gets it perfectly i could put it at the beginning or group it or alternate it because i have that character that says it is an option i can write it wherever i want a new video on how to use the common interpreter on linux in previous classes, we have seen the fundamental when we approach this common interpreter. In the first place, um, we always need to write the comment, then the options, then the arguments. In this case, I'm asking it to list in detail the home folder. In this video, we're going to start using the file system. We're going to learn how we can move, how we can create, modify both files and directories. What do we need to know in the first place? That an instruction is always executed in a place inside my file structure. How can I get to know it? Well, what I would need to do is look directly at the prompt. That is, what's on the left in here. The system gives me the information that will always be there, present. 
and that it tells me, as we have seen before, the user, the machine, and after the colon, it tells me the place where I'm executing that order. In this case, slash home, that is a main directory in our file system. Another way to know this would be um, directly executing the command pwd. It will tell us where I am executing that instruction. Why does it exist? Because not every command interpreter shows us where I am located. Okay? Sometimes it can be too long and some interpreters prefer not to show it or showing just part of it instead of the complete thing. What do we need to do to start moving inside our file system and directories? Well, using a command that is meant precisely to do that, to change directory. And we have the cd command, change directory. What do we have to write? The place I want to go to. For example, I could say slash var, which is the name of our directory of Linux, All right? We see on the right of the dollar sign, we see that it displays slash var. Then if I execute pwd, it tells me that I am in slash var. What happens with this command if I execute it without parameters, only cd? It happens that it understands that I want to go to my personal directory, to the directory in the system where I have all the permissions to do everything I want. Linux is a multi-user system. And it is very important to separate the information from one user and another. So we write CD, then press enter. What it does is to go to my personal directory. And if I execute PWD, it tells me I'm in slash home slash student. Why slash home slash student? Because by default, the home directory contains a subdirectory for each one of the system users. All right. But what happens in here? That in the prompt, we have a special symbol that tells me that I am in my personal directory. I mean, this symbol called the title, um, it tells me it abbreviates this root slash home slash student. Once I am located in a directory, it is very common that I would want to know what's inside that directory. So, our third instruction, because we already know PWD and CD, now we're going to see a little bit deeper, though we have used it before, the command ls, okay? What the command ls does is listing, all right? Listing means to show me everything that is inside the folder I am currently located. What happens now? that we can start looking at many concepts. The first one is option, which we have already explained, but we're going to see some of the options that the common LS has in particular. Remember that the options need a dash, or we could also use a double dash, but most of the time we do it faster using only one dash, and then only one letter that indicates how that command should behave. It can make a list, but it can make it in different ways. In this case, I will want it to make the list with details, all right, with dash L. If we notice, it has displayed the same elements, but in a different way. The first argument, the first option, sorry, would be dash L. What other things can we get to use? We could also use the dash H option. Dash H is telling us the size, but in a way that we humans can understand a bit better. All right, let's enter to a file, to a folder, sorry, that has files, so we can see this better. We will use the CD command again, so I want to go to one of the directories that are displayed. That, in this case, I want to go to Ficheros. To Ficheros, that's where I want to go. What do I have to do? Well, this. I come and write cd, change directory, 
take me to the Ficheros directory. I press enter and the prompt is telling me that I am inside home in the subdirectory Ficheros. But I still don't know what's inside Ficheros. No worries, let's write ls and we'll tell it to display the information with detail. What do I see? I see that I have three directories, documents, photos, and music. Here in the photo, what are we seeing in the photo? That I, using an ls with dash l, I am seeing the information, and in one of the columns, what I'm looking at is the size of the file, all right? That indicates me what the size of the file is. What happens that it is a bit difficult for us to understand the information in bytes. So with an age modifier that is human, it will show us in a human format. It makes it easier for us. It is now in kilobytes. It could also be in megabytes or gigabytes, whatever. All right, then summarizing first option of the ls command dash l to see all the information and dash h to see the information in a pleasant way for us. What else can I see when I get a list? What I can do is order the elements that are displayed, but order according to what? Okay, to do that we'll have to understand a bit about these columns that are displayed here. As I said, we have mentioned the size. But I have the modification date right here, okay? There is a modification date, there is the size, and here, of course, is the name of the file. If we notice, by default, it shows them in alphabetical order. Here we have E, L, P, S, T, right? I didn't specify anything else. What it does is showing me the files in alphabetical order in ascending way, from A to C. But I could want to see them, for example, according to um, the size, for example. What modifier do we need to use? Well, I would use the dash capital S. But of course, if I don't write the dash L, even when they are ordered, I wouldn't be able to prove it. In this case, we write dash L, H, and capital S to make sure it is actually descending, but according to the size. They are already alphabetically ordered, as you can see, STP, TLE, they are mixed, because the ordering criteria is the size. Right now it's ordering in a decreasing way. But we have another modifier. What it does is to order them in the opposite way. That would be lowercase r, all right? It would order things um, increasingly. What would happen if I, for example, write dash lr? By default, it will order things according to the file's names. But now the dash r indicator is instructing it to order it from c to a, okay? I repeat, without R, it would be E-L-P-S-T. With R, it would be T-S-P-L-E. Descending. What else can we learn? Another option that could be interesting is to order um, according to the modification date. All right, let's look for a directory where we can see that better. We set ourselves in a directory where the files have different modification dates to get to know the dash t option. Dash t option will order those files or directories according to the modification dates. If we notice, using dash l t, it is displaying with details and order by date. It displays everything from 2017 first and then everything from 2016. Among 2017, we have things from October, April, and after that, among 2016, August and April, all right? Ordered um, by modification date. They are not ordered by name anymore, nor the size of the file. 
if I add the dash R modifier that we just saw, what it does is to order them but the other way around. First, it would give me 2016, April, August. After that, 2017, April, and October. Okay, from the oldest to the, um, um, the newest. Summarizing what we saw in this video, three commands I wanted to explain. PWD tells us the directory I'm in. CD changes to the directory I write. And the list. To list works with many options. Um, um, it's very interesting, dash L, so essential, to show us the details, to show us the information about the size. And also, so it can order by different, uh, different characteristics of the files or directories. We have seen dash capital S, we have seen uh, the um, T too, and if we don't say anything, it uses the name of the file and R, so it makes it inversely, all right? With this thing, we can start to get to know our file system moving through all the directories and seeing information about the files and the directories contained. We will see more information on more comments in the next videos. And we continue learning more things on the Common Interpreter of Linux now, in this video, I wanted to make a stop to make it very clear a concept called paths that are frequently required by the commands of Linux. Uh, right now, we're looking at a desktop environment, all right, a very light and functional environment in which we're comparing the concept of file and folder that is commonly used after working with Windows or any other operating system with a desktop environment. And I want to compare it with the one we are learning, that is the common interpreter. As you see, in the window environment, we can also find a terminal where everything we are learning works in the same way. It could even have some advantages like the typical menus we already know or the vertical bars to move up or down. The concept I wanted to look at is this one. The concept of path. What is a path? We, with the command we already know, like cd, change directory, I say to which directory I wanted to move to, that's a root, all right? I am indicating where the element on which I want to make an action is, in this case, to change directory, all right? So, let's say it takes me to this element, which with slash home, it now knows where the file is. If we look for it in here, I can go to our file system and see that there is actually a folder that is called home. It's exactly the same. What happens is that I am accessing it and using it in a different way, all right? I click here and enter the folder, then I can see two elements, a student directory and a tux directory. If I go to the common interpreter and write ls-l, it happens exactly the same thing, I'm in the same place, but it's just a different way of displaying the information, all right? I want to go a bit deeper, why? Because the vast majority of commands need roots to function properly. We must understand that it is always necessary to write the root correctly so the system can understand it. If we say, make this action but on an element that it can't find, well, it's impossible for it to do it, all right? Let's review. If I write cd and I don't specify any path, I'll go directly to my home directory. And I can use a pwd command to know where I am in home slash student. Let's look for it in the graphic environment. I go to home student, okay? If we notice home, home, student, student, all right? I am in the same place. And now I go to files, I find myself with documents, music, 
I can expand this and this one, this one too, all right? What should I do over here? Write CD, Ficheros, LS, dash L, and now I can navigate through the different directories and subdirectories. In both places, we are in Ficheros, all right? Paths can be absolute or relative. A very important concept which I'm going to explain so you can understand it very well. In this course, we are taking baby steps. When I want to access this folder, for example, let's say um, Photos Personal, that is right here, I have two ways to do it. In an absolute way, if I do it like this, I will have to mention from the root of the file system to the exact place I want to go to. All the path I have to follow. What does that mean? I will have to write uh, CD from the root of the file system that in Linux it is a slash. You have to go into the home folder and then into student folder, then into Ficheras folder, and then into photos and personal of course, the route is long, and that takes us a long time to write the complete path to get there. All right. I click enter, then ls, and I see photos in the personal folder. Okay. I reached there using an absolute path. If I do it in the window environment, what did I do? Well, I ask it to go to the file system, then go into home, then go into student, then go into ficheros, then into photos, then into personal. Right? In the window environment, we use the mouse. We click to enter into the folders, and here we separate using the slash all the folders names until I reach the place I want to go. What happened? That when I executed this order, I was already inside Ficheros. However, I use all this to ask it to enter Ficheros again. Okay? I had to indicate the beginning of the file system. I just wrote information I could have avoided. Why? Because I was already in the file system. Sorry, I am in the folder called Ficheros. Let's go back to that folder. Now, I'm going to explain the meaning of the double dot. That is, just going to the parent directory, the previous directory. Here we were in the example where I use an absolute path. All the path from the beginning represented by a slash. All the directories I have to go through until I reach the end. But what did I just say? That if I'm already inside Ficheros, I'm inside that folder, why would I have to indicate enter here and then here, then here, then here, if I'm already here? Got it? So, the next concept is a relative path. Relative to what? In this case, to the place I'm currently at. And since I'm already in Ficheros, I only have to indicate the last steps to reach the place I want. In this case, it would be photos and personal. All right? So, with a path that is relative to the place I'm in, in this case Ficheros, what else do I need to indicate? To go into Photos and then go into Personal, all right? So, exactly as I said it, you'd have to write it. CD, Photos, Personal. And what is the difference between an absolute and a relative path when I see them inside a comment? If you notice, I don't have a slash in here. It doesn't start with a slash. That means that let's say um, these two paths from the place I'm in and the place I want to go to, you just join them. All right, I'm currently in student and um, ficheros, so I just add photos personal and press enter, and I'm in the exact same place. Okay, I just added the last steps I was missing to reach my destination. We're talking about two small shortcuts we're going to follow to keep on with the absolute paths topic in a comfortable way. In many occasions, you have seen that I write CD period period, all right? And if we notice, what it does is to go from the directory I'm in to the previous one. 
to the parent directory. Why parent? Because if we see it right here in a hierarchical way, what I did was go backwards and go from personal into photos, all right? So this, um, this way of calling the parent directory, the previous directory, is abbreviated using two periods, okay? Two periods mean that I go to the previous directory, to the directory where my current folder is. When we write ls-la, a means that I want to see the hidden files that in Linux they start with a period. Here, I see two elements, the period and the double period. All right. A period means the current folder, the folder I am in right now. So, it's the same writing ls and writing ls period, okay? Because it knows that the period means the current folder. All right. In that way, an absolute path always start with a slash, but in a relative path, two things can happen. That it doesn't start with a slash or a period or anything. We just start writing letters to refer to a name and it has to be in here. It has to be inside the folder I am in. I mean, I write photos and I can write CD personal. Why? Because it's inside. All right. What can't I do? I cannot, for example, if we see the structure of the path on the left in the window, if I'm in photos, I can't enter music directly because music doesn't belong to photos. Music is not inside photos, but inside ficheros. Therefore, if I write CD music, it doesn't get it because it is not inside the folder I am in. How could I access music without having to use an absolute path? Well, what I need to do is indicate that I have to exit the folder I am in. As you can see, is photos here too. I'm inside photos. I have to say, you have to go back, okay? Go back to Ficheros, and once you are in Ficheros, then you can enter music. All right? How can I say go to the previous folder, the parent folder? Well, we have seen that. CD, double period. So far, I am saying I want to do something in the Fichero directory. But once I am in that place, I can make a reference to any element that is inside the Fichero directory. For example, music. Now it does get it because I have set the path correctly. I said we are in photos. First go to Ficheros and from there you go to music. Okay, this is the first thing. Go to Fichero and inside Ficheros there is an element that's called music. Will our common interpreter get it? Of course it will, all right? This is a relative path, and what we have is another option in which it starts with a dot or a double dot. It doesn't start with a name or with a slash, but what I do is to indicate inside the path that it has to go back, and then from there, I can go inside another folder or go back again. Why? Because once I am inside Ficheros, music, I could go directly to slash home slash students. I mean, I am here in Ficheros. If I write double dot, uh, sorry, I am in music, right now I am in music. I am in music. If I write double dot, I can go to Ficheros, but could I go to students or to home? Of course I could. How? Using double dot many times. I write CD, double dot, I'm asking to go to Ficheros. But if I write a slash now, you're going to go to the parent of Ficheros. That's what I'll be saying with double dot slash double dot. And who is Ficheros parent? Ficheros parent is home slash student. All right. That's not it. Ficheros parent, as I said, is home slash students. 
I go to the terminal and write PWD. Where am I? Am I in home student? Well, that's right. I am in home student, which is my personal directory and that we abbreviated with the title symbol. Another very important consideration when writing paths and writing commands to whatever thing that has letters involved in Linux is that it distinguishes between uppercase and lowercase. It means that a name is different if it is with upper or with lowercase. For example, we've used a moment ago the PW command. What happens if I write it in uppercase? If I write PWD, it tells me it doesn't get it, of course. And if I mix them, it doesn't get it either. It has to be exactly the same. Therefore, if I enter Ficheros, now I go back, it will never understand Ficheros with capital letters, okay? If I change one of the letters, Ficheros with a capital S at the end, it tells me that it's not the same element, all right? That is very important. We have to respect upper and lower case. Another of the very important concepts I was talking about previously was the spaces. They separate the different parts of a common line. Okay? Between the command and the actions and parameters. But what happens if I want to have a file or a folder with a space in the name? We have a little inconvenience. We are going to use a command to create a file which we're going to see in the next video. So, I write mkdir, make dir. If I wanted to write my photos, what would Linux understand? Linux would understand that I want to make two directories, one called my and another called photos. Why? Because it uses the space to separate different things. I do this and there's no error. But what did it do? What it did was it created the my directory and the photos directory, all right? The um, space has that meaning for the command interpreter. And well, this can be a problem, but it's actually not. We just have to know how to make a reference to um, that space. If I want to create my photos, I write mkdir, but I indicate that it is going to be a complete phrase. It is not separated. I can do that using quotes. My, my photos. And it tells me, okay, if you write it in quotes, I get it. There you go. My photos. All right. Of course, I wrote capital F. I could also write mkdir, uh, my photos, and there wouldn't be any error. In Windows, there would be, but not in here. Why? Because it understands that my photos with a capital F is not the same as my photos with lowercase. Making a little summary on the concept of paths, that's the topic we are looking at. We can say that paths can be absolute or relative, and that a path is what a command uses to find the element on which it has to execute an action. If it's absolute, it will always start with a slash, indicating the root of the file system. And I have to indicate all the directories and subdirectories until I find the element that I want. Slash home student fichero, it will go to that directory. Relative path. Relative to what? To the directory where I am executing an order. Therefore, I write cd double dot I'm asking to change to the parent directory, okay? Or if I write cd slash ficheros, that's a relative path too, relative to the place I am in, which is home student. And I will go into an element inside that directory, in this case, fichero, okay? I could also start the path with a dot, okay? Ficheros. What happens? We are indicating exactly the same as CD Ficheros, so it's not common to use it. Unless that um, in some cases, like executing files in the current directory, etc., etc. But for what's useful for us, absolute and relative paths, and the use of the double dot, very important to go back in the file structure. Another concept. The capital letters. 
uppercase and lowercase are not the same, all right? It's common to make those little mistakes. And the third concept, which is also very important, is the use of the space. We have to be very careful when using the space because the common interpreter uses it as a separator between elements. If the same element has a space in its name, we have to use quotes or an escape character. Reaching the point where we know some instructions to manage the file system, it's very common to use paths, to use relative paths, and we're going to see some features that Bash offers us to manage the system when we execute commands we have already executed, or when we write the paths, it will help us to save some time and avoid some mistakes too, all right? It's very common uh, to see the contents of a directory, command ls is very common. And when we are navigating, it is also common to enter some directories, for example, ficheros. If I want to see what's inside Ficheros, I will have to write ls-l one more time. What does Bash offer us? It offers us a way to uh, execute commands we have previously executed. Using the up and down keys, it's going to show me the instructions I have previously used. As you can see, the mv, ls, clear, all of them are instructions that we use in previous videos. I can use clear again. I put it, I leave it in here. I stop pressing the up key. I press enter and it executes as clear. If I want to execute ls, I press the up key three times and I can see the ls command. And I press enter, then it executes, all right? So this is a way to avoid repeating and typing in excessively when we use the interpreter. I can modify it because if I press the up key, it shows me the previous one. But it doesn't mean I have to use it exactly like that. It auto-completes the line with the things I wrote, but I can modify it and write, for example, the H modifier or the T modifier. I press enter and that functions perfectly, all right? Another helpful feature is the one that auto-completes the paths of the elements that I am making reference to, all right? For example, ls-l, and now I'm asking it to list a specific element, for example, list the contents of photos. If I use f, right, I am making a reference to any element of these three that starts with f. It's not documents, it's not music, and now it knows, the system knows, because I said it starts with f. If I now press tab, the system already knows which one is it, because I said it starts with F. So this one cannot be, and neither does this one. It knows that it's photos. It auto-completes, and like I said, that's useful for two reasons, to save time and also avoiding mistakes with upper and lower cases, or with a letter that can make us lose time. I enter here, city photos, and it shows me what's inside the photos directory. CD, space, I press D, press tab, and I go to documents. Now I use clear and write ls-l, okay, drafts, letter, and report CD. I press I, then tab, then enter, ls-l. Now there's one thing. If I wanted to see the information inside one of the files called reports, I can write ls-l, r, and I'd be saying, I want you to list, I want you to show me the information of an element inside a directory that starts with r. But what happens? I have two. See? Report 2008, report 2009. What does bash do? Well, it auto-completes only the thing it knows the things he recognizes. He says, okay, your element starts with R, you say. So it's called report. This is all I'm sure about. But I don't know if you want 2008 or 2009. You have to tell me how should I proceed. So I say, oh, okay, you've already completed until here. I clarify your doubt and tell you 2008. I hit tab again and now he doesn't have any doubt. He knows which file I want. 
I press enter and it works perfectly, all right? We can use that with complex paths and it's very useful because it saves us a lot of um, typing. If I go to home and I want it to tell me more information about that file, but with an absolute path. Let's see what happens. I write ls-l, show me detailed information, in this case on a file, and I start writing. Having the slash, what happens if I press tab? Well, there are many directories in the root of the file system and he doesn't know how to proceed. What could I do in this case? If I press the key two times, he would show me all the possible options, he says. Right now, you have all these options. You tell me how should I proceed. I press H. Do I have another option that starts with H? Of course not, so now it should autocomplete. This is also useful to make an anticipated LS. I mean, if I don't remember what's inside home, I press tab two times, and then he tells me so I can continue writing the path. I say, oh, okay, so inside home, I have tux and student. Well, I wanted to go to student. And what's inside student? I press tab two times and it says, look, you have these options. Oh, okay, I wanted to go to ficheros, then to documents, then to reports. And inside reports, what options did I have? All this. Oh, it was a file called report. It does the same. It stops at the number. If now I press it two times, it says you have two options, 2008, 2009. I wanted 2008, all right? And a path that has a lot of characters, well, we simplify the process using the tab key. It is very useful, all right? So far, two features, up and down keys, we see previous instructions, and tab key to autocomplete the paths to make it faster and avoid mistakes. What happens with the future of moving around the paths? It could happen that the instruction is too far away. It was long time ago when I used this instruction and I have to press the key too many times. I can also look for an instruction I know I use. I press Ctrl R and then I indicate the words it contains or what I remember of that instruction. Maybe I want to go back to an instruction that started with MV. It says, there you have an MV. If it is not that one, I can press Ctrl R again and it shows me all the instructions that started with MV. All right, now I can press enter and it executes. I got an error because I'm not in the correct place but the future just work well. Lastly, I want to tell you about the um, history command. What it does is this. Look, this is the history of commands you have executed. And it numbers them. And if I identify one command I want, for example, for example, this one, all right? Oh, no, that one will throw an exception. So I'm going to execute this one. How can I ask it to do it very quickly? Well, I can write the number it showed me directly. And how do I say that? With an exclamation mark, I say, look, the instruction I want you to execute again is number 135, okay? If I wanted to execute LS, I could say execute number 122, all right? Let's continue. In this video, we're going to learn many new commands to create elements inside a file system and to erase them and to modify them. As we have seen before, the file system is formed by directories, also known as folders, and by files, also known as archives. We're going to learn how to create them and modify them. As we saw in the last video, we use the mkdir command to create directories, right? That directory is going to be empty. I could create, for example, directory, right? Remember, the problem or the way Linux understands spaces, we can frequently find dashes, underscores, etc. If I enter example directory, we see it, it is empty. Does it contain dot and double dot? 
Of course it does, all right? We also saw its meaning in the previous video. If we see the syntax of the mkdir command, it's actually very simple. It will simply create a directory or many. And if I indicate many names, it will create many directories. I can say mkdir, dir1, dir2, dir3, l-l, and I will have my three directories ready, all right? We also saw in the last video that I can create elements or um, go to elements using absolute or relative paths. What happens if I want to create a directory inside one that already exists? Of course I can, as long as I set the path correctly, as in almost any Linux command. I can use absolute or relative paths whenever I want. I can write mkdir, dir1, which we just created, and I create a new directory called photos inside. It works just fine, because I set the path correctly. Dir1 exists, and photos is the new directory I'm creating. I can also say, if I already created Dir1 and photos, inside photos, I want to create nature. All right, no problem. When could I have a problem? I would have problems if I want to create a directory and I want to place it inside one that doesn't exist. For example, dir5. We created dir1, dir2, dir3. I could write dir5, photos. Well, it says that it can't create it because the directory or file doesn't exist. Dir5 doesn't exist. Then I write ls and it isn't anywhere. We have dir1, dir2, dir3, but not dir5. Therefore, it won't work if I ask it to create photos inside dir5 because it doesn't exist. But since it's common to need this way of working, I mean to write down the complete path and to create all the directories that are included in that path, we have the dash p command mkdir dash p and I write dir5 slash photos. Photos doesn't exist, which is the element I want to create right now. And dir5 doesn't exist either. But thanks to dash p, I'm saying that if any element directory or subdirectory that are included in the path that I wrote doesn't exist, it has to create it, right? So I go here and see that we have dir5. And if I enter dir5, I can see we have photos. Okay, we see it right here. So mkdir creates directories, one or many at the same time. And now we're going to see the command p, dash lowercase p, that indicates I want to create all the directories I mentioned in the path. All right, I have created directories. But now I have been creating a lot of things. So my directory now has a lot of information that I do not want. How do I erase files? And how do I erase directories? We have the rm command. All right, rm erases a file. And to erase a directory, I need another option. I need the option dash r. All right, I write dear two, for example, or dear one, it's going to erase that folder and all its content, all right? Therefore, it's an important instruction. We have to um, think before pressing enter because it's possible we make a mistake. We didn't want to, and there's no turning back. We have erased that directory and all its content. If we practice a little bit with paths, I can say erase dear five and photos what am i saying it's going to erase dear five let's see that i write ls dash l has it erased it no it hasn't because what i'm saying with a path like this one is that the element i'm trying to reach is that one photos Okay, we have mentioned that a path can contain other elements, but the one at the end is the one that will take the command to do the action. So I'm saying erase, not dir5, but photos, dir5, and inside the photos directory. Obviously, if I had erased dir5, I would have erased photos too. For a normal file, let's find one around here. 
maybe in documents, lh-l, here are many, for example, report. I repeat, rm erases files. If I write rm letters, it's going to say that's not a file. I cannot erase a file because I haven't set the dash r option. Okay? rm works with the dash r option only if it is a file, not with a directory, all right? I have a file right here, txt, and rm, it's going to erase it. All right, it was there. After I wrote rm report 2009, it isn't there anymore. So, we have seen two new commands. mkdir creates directories, rm erases files. And with the dash r option, it also erases directories. Well, if we know how to create directories and erase directories and files, we're going to see a command to create files, all right? There are a few ways to create files. I'll show you the most direct, which is the touch command. Touch and the file's name. File name. Let's write, for example, txt, and that creates a file. If I see its size, it's zero bytes. Empty. The new file is empty. To erase it, we know rm, the name of the file, ls-l and it's gone, all right? Create files, erase files, create directories, erase directories. What else can I do? I can move them or I can rename them. What command should I use? The mv command, followed by the path of the element I want to modify. What can I do? To move it means I will take it from a folder and put it into another one. For example, let's see. Uh, let's go into letters, and I have two letters, letter for the president and letter for the director. Let's assume I want to put this file into the documents folder and not in letters. So I say mv. It's the first command we see that needs two parameters, obligatory. Why? Because I have to set the origin and the destination. Please move this from one place to another. If I miss one of the parameters, it's going to lack information and won't work. Move the file called letter to the director. Where to? For example, to the parent directory. This could work just with double dot. Or if I wanted to use an absolute path, you know they are longer, I would have to say home, student, files, documents. All right? I press enter, let's see what's inside this folder. Letter to the directory is no longer there, and if I go to the parent directory, I write ls, and it's right there. Therefore, I've moved it from letters folder to the documents folder. What else can I do with the mv command? Well, to rename files, right? With this, I could change the name of that file, and I can write um, mb letter to the director, and I will change it to uh, letter to, um, let's say, letter to Pedro, for example. Letter to Pedro dot txt. Letter to Pedro. ls-l, and I have letter to the director. It's now called letter to Pedro. Notice it has the same size, all right? And it has the same, well, um, let's see a common called cat. It shows us the text information that's inside a file. Letter to Pedro, it says director. The only word containing the original file, letter to the director, all right? Therefore, mv is used to move and to rename. Can I move complete directories? Well, yes, yes, I can. I can move mv letters. It's now going to be in slash home, for example. I'm going to place it there, all right? Well, in this case, let's say slash student, because we were saying Linux uses many users and permissions. So the user student, the one I'm using, doesn't have permission to write there. I will explain that later. Um, we're going to move it into the student folder because I can do whatever I want in my own users folder. I go to my personal folder. Let's see what's inside. 
and the letters folder is right there all right i can move um always indicating the origin element and the destination element we are going to explain the cd command the command that will allow us to copy files the first thing to remember is that i need the source and destination i need two elements that indicate where i'm getting the information from what file i want to copy or directory and then i indicate where i want to paste it the destination so the cd command needs two parameters source and destination i can see what's inside the current directory let's enter for example into files and then into documents now i can see that i have a document here a file called report2009.txt if i wanted to copy that file because i will modify it or for any reason i can write cp the source what is it that i want to copy that report from 2009 and then i write the destination when i set the destination i have two options i can either write the name of a file or a directory if i write a file's name it will copy it with a new name if i write a folder's name it will copy it with the same name but in the destination folder for example i can copy report 2009 to report 2010.txt but i can also copy cd report 2009 two letters letters is a folder that's right here so it will copy a file with the same name into the letters folder i write ls-l i can see the first option to copy from one file to another one and if i enter two letters i can see that report 2009 is also here because of the second time we executed the cd command it also allows us to copy folders but we need to use the dash r option i mean let's clear the screen let's um go to the previous folder and let's suppose i want to copy the letters folder and everything that's inside well i can write cp letters to another folder that i will call letters 2 i get an error here it says the letters folder is omitted i didn't use the dash r option therefore i will not execute it correctly we can see it hasn't changed any element everything's the same what should i do i should write cp dash r to indicate that i'm copying a folder and I'm going to copy letters folder to another one called letters2, also uh, in the current location. And now I have letters in here, which is the original, and letters2, which is the one I just created. If I write ls-l letters to see what's inside, it has those three elements. If I do exactly the same with letters2, I will see exactly the same because i just made a copy all right another thing i can do is to copy many files at the same time i just have to put them next to each other and as the last element the destination where i want to copy them into i mean for example if i have report but the, re the command first always report 2009 and i also want to copy report 2000 10. i will copy them into the folder letters 2 for example okay in the source we are specifying two elements and in the destination the folder where i want to place those elements i go to letters 2 ls-l and i see that they are here one file and the other one too this way i can copy many files at the same time An important thing to consider is that when you copy an element, the destination is created with a user that just executed that command. But it wasn't like this with the MV command. 
which kept the original values. Let's see an example of what I just mentioned. Let's go to the Photos folder, for example. And we'll see that we have a file that belongs to the user Tux and the group users. I will explain this later. But right now, I just wanted to highlight this small difference between moving and copying, all right? If I move, I'm going to move the desktop file to desktop to JPG. All right, in this case, I'm changing the name. What it will do is to change the name, but it didn't touch the user and the group. If I move it to another folder, it will do exactly the same. Therefore, the MV command doesn't modify the owner nor the group of that file I set as source. But CP command will do, because it creates a new file. So it will create it with, um, uh, with the user that is executing the command and not with the owner of the source file. I mean, if I'm student, you know, you can see that right here, and I want to copy the file that originally belongs to Tux, the new file that will be created will not belong to Tux, but to student, who is the one creating it. That is, I write cp desktop2 jpg2 my desktop student dot jpg what i have now is that the new one my desktop student doesn't belong to tux anymore not users but it has been created with my permissions all right so the difference between moving and copying moving doesn't modify the destination's property but copy does because it creates a new element so we continue learning about the common interpreter of Linux. And since we know the commands to move and copy, um, we find ourselves in the need of doing both actions, but affecting many files inside our file system. What do I mean? Well, so far we have moved only one file or one directory. But what happens if I wanted to do that same action, but over many at the same time? Then I would have a problem. For example, if I enter to photos and see what's inside. Well, I found um, two files, these two, classic tux and modern tux. And let's say I want to copy them to a folder. So I write mkdir and I write tux. And if I wanted to copy them with the things we already know, well, I have two options. Write in CP, classic tux, and I want to move it to tux once, and then execute that again, modern tux to tux, all right? And the other option would be to write the um, uh, source files, and then the destination at the end, all right? What I get is exactly the same, but what's the problem? That I have to type many names, so it gets a little heavy, and if I had a thousand files, that would be impossible. I wouldn't be able to write that much. What does Bash offers me to be able to solve this problem? Well, it offers me some wildcards that can make a reference to the file's name, right? And what happens is that we have two different wildcards. Let's see how they work. When I make a reference to a file or a folder, I use its name, a path as we have seen in previous videos. What I want to use now is a character that includes tons of possibilities to affect many files. All right? What do I mean? That when I want to show the information about a normal file, let's say classic tux, I write the complete name, all right? I write all the characters included in the name. 
but I have a character that is a wildcard, the asterisk, with which I indicate that I don't care what's after that position, whatever is fine. What will this do? Well, the file starts with a T, a U, and an X, but after that, I don't care, including all the files that contain any character in the place I put the asterisk. That is the first wildcard we're going to see. What it does is to select tux and everything to the right, tux and everything to the right. This one won't count because it doesn't start with tux in lowercase, this one either, nor this one, nor any other inside the folder. But this one does because it complies with the rule of starting with tux, and after that, whatever, all right? So, this is also very useful when I want to, um, to include all the files with a specific extension. Therefore, I can say whatever is to the left of the dot doesn't matter to me. Include all the files. I write an asterisk, of course I have to include the dot, and on the right I force it to be, for example, GIF. All right? Would the JPG be affected? No, because they don't meet the criteria. They don't end in dot GIF, but these files would be included. Shell command and a logo Ubuntu. All right. Therefore, I have a way of writing a path that involves many files inside our file system. What is the most generic use I can give to the asterisk wildcard? To use it alone, directly writing ls-l asterisk. I would be saying, show me in detail all the elements inside the current folder. It would show me the files, and then it would also execute that command on the personal folder and the tux folder. If I wrote ls-l asterisk dot asterisk, it looks the same, but it's not, because I'm setting a condition. The name has to contain a dot, okay? So it won't include the folders, like personal or tux. So it would show me the files, but be careful, only the files with an extension, because in Linux we could frequently find files without an extension. If we want to see an example, it's very simple. We create a file called readme, that is something very common in Linux, and if I execute ls-l asterisk dot asterisk, it won't show up because the criteria of an existing dot is not met. However, if I just write ls, I can see it now, I didn't write any condition, so of course it displays it now. From here, and knowing that an asterisk can be replaced by part of the name, or all the name, we can start creating our own expressions to make a reference, for example, uh, to the file containing an A. To the right, we can have whatever, to the left, too, so we can see the files that contain an A within their name. But I could also use it, for example, I'm going to say, show me the ones that start with a specific letter, ls-lt asterisk, all right? I'm forcing it to find files that start with a T, but after that, we can have whatever. I mean, whatever, whatever character, however long, it doesn't matter. In the last video, I've explained the use of the asterisk as one of the wildcards that we use to make a reference to many files at the same time. Now we're going to explain the use of the question mark, which is also a wildcard. And we use it to tell the system that in the place where we put it, we can have whatever character. It's not so general as the asterisk, but we could also use it to make reference to many files. If we navigate through the, our folders, we can go to Documents, and we're looking for, let's say, Reports. And here we have um, two text files that look very similar, but there is one character that is different. We write ls-l, then we see those two files, all right? I can make a reference to them, if we use the character we've seen, I say report asterisk, 
report asterisk. It's going to display the report of 2008 and 2009, but since they are only different in one position, it's useful because I can show you that I can also say report and then write in this character position here. I don't care what character it is, it doesn't matter. So I write a question mark. We can have whatever character there dot txt all right and there it displays that both report 2008 and report 2009 are valid what is the difference between this and the asterisk that since it's not so generic it can be useful when i want to indicate that there needs to be a character or if i want to indicate that in specific places within the file's name there should be some characters but i don't care which ones and the asterisk not only indicates that there could be a character in that position but also there could be any number of characters so it's too generic for example let's look for drafts and we see that we have a number of drafts on which I could be working on and that I would like to erase, copy, move or whatever to make a reference to all of them in a specific block. If I write for example lh-l draft asterisk it's going to display all the drafts the one with one number, the ones with two numbers and the one without any number. Alright, so there I cannot say show me only the ones with one number because the asterisk is indicating that um, in that position where the asterisk is there could be absolutely anything it doesn't have a limit of characters but it's different if I say here I need only only one uh, only one letter and then there could be a txt Alright, so it won't display draft because I'm saying there has to be something. It won't display draft 23, draft 13, or draft 10 because it doesn't meet the criteria of having one letter followed by a dot, but there are two letters, alright? If we modify that instruction and I write two question marks, now it will display the files with two numbers, but not the ones with only one number, nor the one without any number, alright? I'm going to show you the asterisk example again for you to see that it's way more generic because it is not setting the number of characters there should be in a specific place. Using both wildcards won't give you any trouble. For example, I could write lh-l to draft and then say there has to be two positions there and txt to the right. I would be forcing it to find two characters followed by txt. What happens if I create a draft, for example 15, but this time I make it doc, or maybe any other extension, odt. All right, lh-l, so if I want to say there has to be two characters but after that i don't care about the extension i could also use the asterisk in here all right so we can combine them as long as i write them correctly this meets the criteria of having two characters and there is also a dot right but to the right i really don't care whatever thing there is odt txt or dot doc Summarizing what we have explained about wildcards, we have two. The asterisk means that in the place where I put it, there could be anything within the name of the file or files on which I want to execute a command. And the question mark, that indicates that there could be any character, but it has to be in that precise position. It doesn't refer to any number of characters, but only one character. Hello friends, welcome to a new topic on the use of Linux, specifically about its common interpreter. I hope you have been practicing to use and handle the commands and their instructions. Now in this video we're going to talk about something different from handling files as we've seen so far, 
but it's very important to know how to administrate the users inside our system. And that we should know who is executing a command and the importance of all this for Linux. The first distinction we have to do is between the administrator user called root and the rest of the users who don't have as many permissions as it to use the system. As we're going to start learning how to use commands that do need permissions to install packages, to install programs, and to modify the system environment, well, we need to know how to use the administrator's permissions. We can always know who is the user that is executing the comments because it is to the left of the at. Therefore, student can currently execute whatever he wants under his permissions inside its personal folder, but he cannot make significant modifications to the system. If I needed to use the admin's permissions, I could use in some systems, for example, in Ubuntu, I use the command sudo, followed by the command that needs the permission to execute as administrator. But in Debian, we normally use the su command to change the user and then execute many things as administrator. Therefore, what the su command does is to switch to another user, okay? If I don't say which user I want to switch to, it will understand that I want root, the system's administrator. It will obviously ask me what the password of root is. Then if I press enter, I can see that next to the at is root, the administrator. Another very important concept is groups, groups of users inside the system. A user always belongs to a main group but can belong to other secondary groups. This is to improve the management of permissions that a certain user gets, or of a group of users I can manage however I need it. When we execute ls-l, it displays a column that indicates who is the owner of those files or elements. It would be the first column right here, and then it tells us the group. In this case, it's also named student, but it's just because by default, the system created it with the same name. If we go to a folder where we practice some commands already, let's go to, for example, documents, ls-l, and we see that in that column, we have different information. We have elements created by root, and elements created by student. As we have mentioned several times, I can always see my current user. Looking at the prompt to the left of the ad, but I also have comments that can tell me. It's curious, but there is, for example, a comment called, who am I, all right? And there is another one. It tells me the groups I belong to, group. Okay, right now I'm the user root that belongs to the root group, I am the administrator user that belong to the administrator group. I'm going to log out from the current session because I've executed the su command and I'm using the system as root and if I write exit, I will be student again, all right? Let's see, um, now I'm going to enter documents again. And if I execute who am I, it'll tell me I am student and if I execute group, it will tell me I belong to the student group. What other command can I use to see this information? The command ID, all right? It tells me I am the student user and belong to those groups. The ID command can be followed by the user I want to know more about. For example, ID tux. But there we see information about the user, the main group, and all the other groups it belongs to. All right, and if you notice, we can see information here about the user, about its main group, and all the secondary groups it belongs to, okay? Let's switch user to tux. We use the command su again. Of course, it will ask me for the password of the user, in this case, tux. We use the command id again. If we want to see all the information it shows us, 
But now it tells us that the main group it belongs to is users. And if I create a new file, touch, let's name it file, file tux with big letters, then ls-l, then I can prove how it says that tux is the user who created that file and users as the owner group of that same file. In the next videos, we'll explain why this is so important and how it relates to the system's permissions. So we can administrate users elements inside the file system and permissions. Once we know the basics about users and groups in this video, we're going to see how to create them. Also, we're not going to go deep on this because this course is not about administrating the Linux system, but about the use of the common interpreter. But to have a better understanding of permissions, we need to understand the use of the users and groups because they are deeply related. So we're going to see um, some instructions to manage users and groups. But I repeat, we're not going to go deep. Things we already know, that the system has many users and many groups, and that every element in the file system will always have a user that is its owner and also a group. Sometimes the names can be the same because the system has named it that way, and some other times they could be different. That is the most common situation. We can create a user at any given time, of course, but since it's a task that should be done by the administrator, remember, I'm always executing comments as a specific user. And for me to create a new user, I would have to be an administrator. And the administrator, remember, is the user root. Okay, so to switch to root in Debian, we use su, I press enter, and then the password of root, I make sure I'm there so I can start using the new command called add user. All right, then I write the name of the new user. In this case, let's create Anna, a short name. What is the system doing? It is using some default settings, as you can see. It adds the user Anna, but it also adds the group Anna because I didn't say anything different. If I had done so, it would have used that other name. There are also some other tasks, like creating the personal folder for Anna. It does that as well. And lastly, set a password. It is also copying something that contains an example folder. And here, since the password has to be ciphered, has to save it securely, it offers us the opportunity to set it right here. I write the password two times, and here it is asking us for administrative data. We could fill them or not. It won't affect when we use the system. I can write Anna, and if I don't want to write anything else, press enter. It asks me if the information is correct. I say it is, and now I have my new user Anna ready. I can see if the personal folder has been created with ls-l home. Here it is. And who does it belong to? Of course, to herself and the same group. We could also create all the groups we need using the command add group. In this case, we're going to create a group called students and we can create it as a main group or a secondary group. Now we have to use a command to modify a user, user mod. And I'm going to use the option dash G, which is going to modify the main group. I repeat again, I am going to go a little bit fast because it is not the course's objective. Okay, I'm simply going to show you how you can do it. And you can see it again at any time you want. Remember the ID command that will tell me information about the user and the groups it belongs to. Then I see that the user Anna belongs to the student group because I have just changed that. 
In case I want to verify that what Anna does will have that user and owner, I can switch to Anna. Remember, I'm already there. And I can create, if I go to my directory, Anna's file, ls-l. Now I can verify that this file belongs to the user Anna and the group student. We also have a command that will change the user and the group of an element inside the file system. To do that, I will have to be an administrator. Therefore, we execute su again. We write the admin's password. Now I can execute the command chown. That works this way. First, I write the user to whom I'm going to change that element colon and the group. This way I will say that the owner is now going to be Tux, the group, users, and what element do I want to change? I want to change Anna's file. If I see the content of this folder, I just change the user and the group at the same time. I could also do that independently. I could just write that I'm going to change the owner to root without the colon and as file press enter it has changed correctly how could I change the group well I can put the colon and then the group to which I'm gonna change it for example let's put it again in Anna's group now we see that only Anna has changed but the user root hasn't changed so we can change both things at the same time, or we could change them independently. Another important task we need to learn how to do is to change the user's passwords. This can be done by the administrator or by the user himself. To do that, we use the password command. If we don't write anything, the instruction would change the password of the user that is executing that command but the administrator can write the name of the user to whom he will change the password. In this case, Anna, enter, I change the password, press enter again, and the password has changed correctly. I repeat again, if I hadn't written anything else, I hadn't indicated a username, I would be changing the password of the user that executed. As a summary, let's remember the four comments we saw in this video. Create users, add user, followed by the name, for example, John. I, in this instruction, can set the password and an administrative information that in this case will live in blank. What else can I do? Create a group, add group, for example, citizens of the world, and then I can modify the group it belongs to. Let's use user mod followed by dash g. Let's say citizen to which user? To the one that I just created, John. An example of administration. User mod has many other options. Another command we saw, pass wd to modify the passwords. For example, user John, the one we just created, now I will modify the password and everything just updated successfully. In this video, we're talking about the permissions of the elements in the file system. When we execute ls-l to see detailed information about a folder, we can see in the first column a few letters. They are indicating which permissions are granted and which are not. When we see a dash here, it means that there is a permission that it is not granted. And when it is, we see a letter. We can find the different letters. R, it means we have the reading permission granted. W, it means we have the writing permission granted. X means we can execute that file. Therefore, it has a type of code the computer can understand. Permissions always have the same position in this column. 
it indicates which ones it has and which one it doesn't. So, R will always be in the first place in all the group of permissions the element has. There are three groups. Here it tells us the permissions the user has. Here it tells us the permissions of the group that owns the file. And here it tells us the permissions for the rest of the users. They are independent, but they have the same meaning. Therefore, the order will always be R, W, X. If the letter shows up, it means the file has that permission granted. If you can't see the letter, it means the file doesn't have that permission granted. I repeat, if you can see an R, if there is an R, it means it does have the reading permission. Second position, W. If you can see a W, it means it has a writing permission. Third position, X. If you can see an X, it means it has the executing permission. If you cannot see it, then you can't execute it. Therefore, we can find ourselves in this situation, the one I'm highlighting right now. In the group of permissions of the user, the ones referring to the owner of the element, we only see dash, dash, dash. That means it doesn't have any of the permissions granted. Not the R to read, not the W to write, not the X to execute. In this example, I've granted permissions in each of the files, so we understand what each of those elements do. I mean, what does the option R reading do? What does the option W do? What does the option X do? And what happens if we don't have any permissions granted? What do we have to notice? Well, in this document that belongs to the user student, and therefore it has the permissions you see right here. Since my objective is for you to understand the use of the permissions, I have set them all the same for every group, so it's something like this. This user has the reading and writing for every user of the system. This one only reading, this one none, and this one only executing. Let's start with the first one. It tells me that the user student can read and write, but it cannot execute. Let's see that. Can I read the content of this file? Remember, the cat command quickly shows me the content of a text file, so I indicate that I want to see the file letter writing. It does allow me to see it. Could I modify it? Let's try it. I'm going to use a very quick command. It's just going to add a line. New line. What is it going to add it? Inside the file, letter writing. Doesn't display an error, so it means I was able to write. Let's see it. And that's right. When I display the content again, the modification was applied correctly. Let's clear the screen and try the same with the file letter reading. So I write cat letter. I'm sorry, cat letter reading. But I can read it. Why can I read it? Because letter reading it's um sorry it has the reading permissions r for reading but it doesn't have the w for writing let's try to write on it as we did before new line and i will try to add it to letter reading what does it say it says that i can't do that permission denied the W permission is not granted. Therefore, I won't be able to write on that file. Let's display all the letters. Let's see what happens when I don't have any permission granted. So the basic would be show with the content. Let's see the secret letter. Uh, that's, oh, what is happening today? Secret letter. Permission denied, not even written. And if I try new line to write on it, 
I can't. I can't read it nor write on it because it doesn't have the W or R granted. If now we show the permissions the file in the current folder have, we see that the one with executing permissions is the one called executable code. If I try to execute, for example, letter writing, how can I do that? I will have to say, I want to execute a file from the current folder that's represented with, by the dot. So I say letter writing, the tab key won't autocomplete because he knows I don't have the permissions. So when I press enter, it tells me permission denied. Let's see what happens with executable code. I can do two things. See its content with cat, same as always, executable code. So there are some short instructions that it's going to understand. It will tell us on what day of the week we are. This I can execute. I write dot slash executable code. I press enter, it executes that code we saw and it says today is Tuesday. So X is allowing us to execute and it's necessary that the file is actually a program and that the system understand what it has inside. Now we're going to explain the permissions applied to folders. In the last video, we explained the ones applied to files and now we'll see what happens when it's about a folder. In the first place, we have to say that the first letter means the type of element it is in the file system. If it's a dash, it's just a normal file. If it's a D, it means that it is a folder. We could also see an L, that would be a link, but this will be enough for us. And then we see three groups with three permissions each one. RWX would affect the user, RWX would affect the group, and RWX would affect the rest. If there's a dash, that's a permission not granted. If there is a letter, it does have that permission. What did we say previously? That the R was for reading, the W for writing, and the X to execute. Now, with the folders, the meaning will be like this. R will mean to list, to be able to see what's inside that folder. W will mean to modify its content. What's the content? Well, some elements. We could write files inside or we could erase them, okay? Not their content, but the elements themselves. That is, create elements, create files or directories, or erase files or directories. Not to modify the content of that file. That has to be indicated in the own file's permissions. And X will mean to access. I'm able to enter. I can execute CD and to be um, to go inside that folder, to position myself in it. What will we see? Well, here I have uh, the folder, for example, documents, and I will enter two documents. Let's clear the screen and LS to show a few folders with different settings to understand what I'm able to do with each one of the files. Let's see. For example, I have the W permission in that folder and X one. So X grants me access. I can write CD modify and W grants me that I can create or erase elements in it. For example, I can write touch file one, all right? It will do it without any trouble. But notice that when we execute ls-l, it says permission denied. It might seem curious, but it's doing exactly what it has to do. Why permission denied? Because it doesn't have the listing permission granted. R in a folder is to list the content. I want it to show me, but I don't have the permission. Nevertheless, I can create other files and they will be there, all right? The fact that we cannot see them doesn't mean that they are not there. What else can I do? Well, if I get out from this folder, I could try to access this one right here, secret. I will try to see to enter into secret. It tells me permission denied. 
I can execute ls-l in secret? No, I can't because I don't have any of these permissions. In both of the directories we're missing in this example, we can see more advanced cases of things that can happen to us. But they are doing exactly what their permissions let them do. For example, I have the listing folder that has the R granted. Therefore, I can enter to because it has X and I can execute ls-l. If we see the document right here, we notice it has reading and writing, right? But remember the folder doesn't have writing. I can't modify the content of this directory. So the thing is, if I try to erase document one, will it allow me to do it? Think about it for two seconds. Well, the answer would be, if I notice it says I can modify the content, but not the element itself. Whether I can modify the document itself, I see it in the folder's permissions. Therefore, RN document one, in this case, will not allow me to erase that document. Although I can modify the content, if I try to add a line into document one, as we did before, it will allow me without any trouble. Okay. I write Lina. Let's see. There it is, Lina. I can modify the element, but I cannot erase it. And I could also create a new one. Document four. Nope because of the same reason. The folder doesn't have the W granted. I cannot create new elements. Not a file, not a folder. All right? Permission denied. Another curious case we can find is that there is a folder that has the R permission. I mean, I can list the content, but I cannot enter. Here we have a weird case, but my objective is that you understand each of the permissions separately in a way that I can analyze what happens when having only reading but won't let me enter because it doesn't have the X. But how is it possible that it does have the R? Something curious, because if I execute a ls l no, without the dash L, Sample only, it will tell me the elements it has, letter one and letter two. But when I try to access the folder to do something, then it says permission denied. I can't access to each of the elements themselves because I don't have the X granted. I can't enter, but I can access to the information about the elements inside. If I execute ls-l, the result is even more curious because as I said before, it can list them, but it cannot access to them to get to know them better and see their properties. Summarizing, for a directory, we have the same permission structure than those of a file, but the R, W, and X mean something different. In this case, R is to list, to show the content inside that directory. W is to modify that content, modify the elements, I mean, to create new elements or erase the existing ones, and X to be able to enter to that directory. Once we know the necessary concepts, such as users, groups, and permissions of the elements in the file system, we need to know now the command that can modify those permissions. The command is chmode. What I need to do is to indicate what permissions to grant or which ones I want to deny. Generically, I would say if I want to grant, I use the plus sign and then the letter I want to grant. Let's suppose I want to grant for this one that doesn't have any secret letter, I will grant reading permissions, plus R, I am adding the reading permission, to what file? To secret letter, ls-l, and it's done. We can see secret letter now has the reading permission. 
What would I do if I want to deny permissions? Well, instead of using the plus sign, I would use the minus sign. I want to subtract that permission. I would do it in the same way, ch mode, minus r in this case to secret letter. If I see the information, it has been modified, it doesn't have the permission anymore. With this option, just writing a plus or minus sign, and then the permission I want to modify, it, as you can see, they change in the three groups of permissions for the user, for the group of owners, and the rest of users. In case I want to do it more precisely and modify only one of them, what I would have to do is to make a reference using the letter U for the group of users, G for the owner group, and O for the rest. I mean, if I indicate that I will grant or deny permissions on this group, I will have to write the letter U. If I want to make a reference to these permissions, I write lowercase g. And if I want to make a reference to these groups that are the rest of the users, I will have to refer it to it with the letter O. What do we write then? CH mode. I want to take this R away from secret letter. Or I could also take this one away so the rest of the users can't read it. But with an U, I would be saying, don't affect everyone, affect only to the owner's permissions. And I will also say that it has to eliminate the reading permissions. Minus R over what element? Secret letter. LH-L. We see that the R for the group is still there, the R for the rest is still there, but the R for the user is not there anymore, all right? So now we can continue doing other things. For example, I will erase the X just to try it from the group of the rest of users. I write CH mode, O, others, plus X to what element? To secret letter. LH-L and we see that it has added that X in that specific place. I could combine many without any trouble. I could say what I want to do is to the user add reading, which we took away previously. And in this occasion to the group, I will, um, I have to write a comma here, okay? I add to the group, I will set the missing one, that's the, I will set the, Execution one. We're just making tests. To what element? To secret letter dot txt. LH L and we see that it added this X because we indicated so with this G plus X. And with U plus R, we set this permission right here. R for the owner user. The second way of using CH mode would be instead of using plus to indicate that I want to add or include another permission and minus to say that I want to take it away, what I can do, depending on the case, is to say to this group of permissions, I grant these permissions and the ones that I mentioned, I will take away. What does it mean? That if I write CH mode and say the user will keep the permissions I will write after the equal sign, and I only write W, that's the only one I will grant, only the W permission. If I don't write R, it means it will take it away. If I don't write the X, it will take it away too. And using a comma, I can make a reference to the other permissions groups, and to the other ones, I will change it completely. Because here, I have RX, I will say, or, I will change only one so you see that I can do whatever I want. R and X. Those are the ones I will set for secret letter. All right? So I press enter and what I get is that secret letter to the group of users I only left the W. R and X are gone. And here to the other users I only left the W and X different from before. Okay? In secret letter. Okay, so I can directly add or subtract with the plus or minus sign, or I can use the equal sign to establish which ones are granted, and if I don't mention one, I'm taking it away. I could also do the following. I could write ch mode, 
U G O secret letter. All right. What will this do? Well, I just said that the permissions for each of the groups, users, groups, and the rest. Which ones did I grant? None. Since I didn't grant any, it has to take them all away. Now let's do the opposite so you can see it. Let's grant them all. RWX, RWX, and this one, um, oh well, RWX2. LH-L. Now it's green, indicating that it's executable. So you know that we have to be more careful with this. Hello again friends, we are going to continue learning about the Linux console. In this case, we are going to look at something different, that is about software administration. The programs we have in our operating system to have more functionality. The first thing we need to know is how Linux installs its software. Here we have a very important concept called repositories. Repositories are servers on internet that keep the necessary files for the software to work on our machines. I mean, we search in those servers, see what packages are available, and we can automatically download those packages using the tools in the command console in Linux. What do I have to do in the first place? Well, checking and setting the list of repositories I have in my system. That is, the links in which I have to go find those repositories online. It is very common that we have a file with the settings where we keep the repositories, and that file is called source.list. The first consideration to have in mind is that to administrate software, I need to have administrator permissions. Therefore, we are going to execute the commands as root. In this case, if we are a normal user, I have to execute su, my root password, and I can start configuring the file sources.list. We are going to use the nano editor, it's very common among all distributions, and we look for the file in etc apt sources.list. When we first install the system, we can find ourselves with lines like this one. That is, the list of packages to install firstly, and it's getting it from, a, from the CD-ROM. But now, if we're not going to use any CD-ROM or DVD, we can ignore that line using a hash sign, if we don't want to erase it. So the system will ignore it and will not look for any packages there. What? constitutes a line inside sources.list? Well, first we found the word deb or deb-src. What does it mean? Well, that I, with the word deb, will ask for the installers for the packages .deb that are the ones that will be installed in my system. And, and with the deb-src, I have the source files. Remember, the most important thing about the free software is that I can see how the programs are made I can install them and I can modify them if I have the necessary knowledge. It could also happen that I don't want to lose bandwidth if I'm not going to use those source files. I can do the same as the previous line and write hashtag. What do we see next? We see the URL of the server, the link where it is going to ask for the list of available packages it has. And then we see the version of our distribution, and this version of Debian is called Jesse. And then the sections where it can download the packages. The sections are commonly divided by the support they officially receive from the distribution, and also according to the licenses that they have. If it's completely free, if it has any proprietary software, etc. This is the main one, then we have contrib and non-free, right? Once we have everything configured, we can add more repositories, like specific software from specific companies. But to make it faster, we are going to work with just one. I save that list, and the first thing that I have to do is to tell the system to go and ask those servers again to update the information on the available packages. 
What command will we use? The command apt get. In this case, I say update. Once the list of available software has been updated in those repositories, well, I can look for, for example, the packages I want. Let's say that I'm looking for, let's clear the screen, some sort of game to entertain myself, maybe a mind game, or maybe I could look for the VLC player. In this case, I will write apt catch because now we're using the list of packages we have in our computer and I write search and as I said we can see if VLC the famous multimedia player is available and here it is it searches both in the name and the description everything that is related with the word we indicated in this case VLC if I want to search for something that has to do with mines Oh, sorry, it has to be search first, and then what I'm looking for, mines. Now I have the list of software related to mines. All right, now we're going to proceed with the installation. We're going to install VLC. How do I have to do it? I have to use apt-get again, because I am saying I want to download the install package from those repositories. I will say install and then VLC, all right? When I say press enter, it tells me the packages that are going to be installed. All right, that's always interesting to check. And sometimes he tells me that it's going to install all the packages because they depend on this one to function properly or that they need to be updated or whatever. That's why you see it's interesting to look at the information it is giving me. And once it's finished, I have the VLC available in my computer to execute it. I could go there directly to the software menu in my graphic environment, multimedia, and here it is, my VLC player, and if I click on it, I can execute it, and I could also save, let's save a playlist that is called list, I press save, and I have my VLC completely functional. As you can see, installing packages is very easy, but also uninstalling them. But I'm going to mention two things. I could write apt get to uninstall, I write remove, followed by the name of the package, VLC. This is always a little bit faster because it doesn't have to download anything. I say yes, but remember it is always interesting to check what it will do. This line gives you a little summary. Want to remove a 92 not updated. Want to remove, well, I like that idea. That's exactly what I want to do. And after that, if you notice, it starts uninstalling everything that's necessary. And it's also removing everything referring to the menu on the desktop. All right, it has finished on installing, and now if I look for it again, in this case, we're going to use another command that is called aptitude search VLC because it also tells us the state of the package, the state that is if it's installed or not installed. And if we notice, we have a C. A C means that there are still setting files in my system the package is not there anymore but we still have the configuration files if i go to the software menu i see that it is not there but in the system it has left some things behind about its configuration how do we fix this i will have to use apt get but in this case instead of using remove i will say purge remove the package and everything else, everything that is related to that package, okay? It tells me what is going to remove. He knows those configuration files are still there. I say yes, and it continues cleaning the system from all the packages on the configuration files that were pending from VLC. 
I look for it with aptitude. Now it's going to say it has a P ready for installation, but it's not installed and it doesn't have a C. That means configuration files. Therefore, it's completely uninstalled from the system.